right through them and then cut the artery up top. So you need to have a cloth and it needs to be about an inch and a half to two inches wide. Okay, that's a big deal. And the way you tie it matters too because you're, you're using leverage. But if you've got to sit there and you're cranking down and cranking down and cranking down, then your tourniquet's in the wrong spot. Eventually, you know, you will get it to stop or he'll pass out, but that's not, just means you're not in the right spot. So it's important to know where your pulse points are. Okay, so we covered where your radial is. Let me get this off of you, Scott. All right, thank you, buddy. We covered where your radial is. We all know thumb side, okay, this is your radius bone. That's your radial pulse. Your brachial pulse is like if you were checking a baby or a small child right here, okay? Carotids are here. Obviously, we're not tourniqueting them, but just so you know, carotids are here. Femorals are right inside the mid, mid portion of your leg, just below your growing midline, okay? And then you actually have some down your ankles, but you can't, you can't check that in your ankles or your feet because you're not going to, you can check it, but you're not going to put a tourniquet on it, okay? That's far away from the heart where you should be able to get the bleeding stopped with direct pressure. So that's tourniquets. Again, I mean, it's not necessarily a last resort, but it is in a way. You want to do it for arterial bleeds. So we want to know we're looking for squirting blood, bright red. We don't need to put a tourniquet on a venous bleed. Venous bleeds are slow, they ooze. There's not pressure behind them like there is on arterial bleeds so your clot can set. All that needs is direct pressure, okay? And you just hold it. That's something that you can use in that situation if you have them. If you don't, find something. Use your shirt. Shirts, shirts work good if you know how to tie them, if you tie them right. So again, normal pulse for an adult is 60 to 100. Normal respiratory rate is 12 to 20 times a minute. Now we'll talk real quick about hypovolemia. You might know it as shock. So how do I identify shock? Shock is a, shock's a big deal. We still can't stop shock. Over 80% of people, there's, there's a few forms of shock and it's just stages of shock. Over 80% of people that go from shock to decompensated shock, even if it's in the hospital, die. It's, it's a very rare thing that you actually can live through. It's also, there's not a test alive whether you're in the hospital or on the field, that can identify shock in advance. So it's very much, we just need to look at the clues. We need to figure out, is this person shocky? If Scott's sweating like crazy right now and pale in this air-conditioned room, he's in a form of shock. Dehydration is a form of shock. It's called hypovolemic shock. It means a lack of fluid or a lack of blood in the pipes creating shock. If you're getting dizzy a lot, if you're feeling just bad or without energy, you're probably dehydrated. That's a chronic condition in today's society is dehydration. There's septal shock, which is very common in the elderly. Like if you have a grandmother or whatever that's you know in a nursing home or at home with her family and she gets a small little cut and nobody worries about it. And then a week later, grandma is completely not within her normal mental state. Most likely that little cut became infected. It got into the blood. Back in the old days, they actually called it blood poisoning and she's now in a form of shock, okay? There's anaphylactic shock. That's the guy that eats the peanut or gets stung by the bee. That's a big deal. That causes an over-response by your body's immune system. And what it does is it causes massive vessel dilation all at once. So all the blood just goes woof, down because gravity's not our friend. And that's a form of shock too. And that can take several days, if it doesn't kill you, several days to recover from in the hospital. Um, there's cardiogenic shock which is pretty self-explanatory, okay? If your heart, if the pump isn't pumping effectively like it should, that can send the body into shock. There is obstructive shock, which comes from embolises, thrombuses, things like that that prevent the blood flow, which can lead to cardiogenic shock. Um, and then there's distributive shock and neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is most likely something that you guys could really actually experience or somebody you know. Neurogenic shock is if this gentleman was standing in front of me and I hit him in the back with a sledgehammer, he got kicked with a, by a horse. He might, it, what happens is from where the injury is on the spinal cord down, you have massive dilation, so your blood pools and they experience paralysis. It's not permanent paralysis. It usually heals itself within two or three weeks. But because of the vasodilation, that puts the strain on your heart. You can't, your smooth muscles, the muscles that are working that, would, that you don't know, like the reason your heart's beating, the reason your vessels can constrict or relax, all of those things, they quit working. So your heart can't pump blood. It can't get it out of the pipes that are down here to the rest of the body. 
So that leads to form of shock and ultimately death. Um, what else? So we covered respiratory. You guys want to talk about kids at all in their vital signs? What's that? Broken bones. That's a great one. Um, in your first aid kits, if you have them, or if you get them, or if you use your shirt, whatever, just make a triangle splint or a triangle bandage or whatever. Um, and it's really easy. This is just all wilderness stuff. So you have your triangle bandage, and essentially you lay the injured area in a, in a way that's comfortable for that person in this bandage to give it support. And then you just tie it around their neck. And if you can, give them something to put in their hand. There's a lot of reasons for that besides just comfort. There's actually medical reasons behind that. If you can't, that's okay. But if you can, put something in that hand because it helps later with the alignment and it also helps prevent tissue and blood vessel damage. So never try to set it in the field. If I got there and it was a completely settable area and he didn't have a pulse, I would try to set it right there. But I would give him medication before I did it so it's not this horrible event. They wouldn't remember it. If, and hopefully I could get it set. If I couldn't, I would probably fly them out depending on the age of the person because like if it's a child and it's near the growth plate, that's a permanent disability for the rest of their life. You know what I mean? If, especially if it's down here. So um, what else can we talk about? Heat stroke, good idea. That's a great one. So heat stroke happens really easy actually and, it's, and it, a big portion that contributes to heat stroke is dehydration. You'll hear every medical conference you ever go to they will hammer dehydration down your throats because everybody's dehydrated. Nobody drinks enough water. So heat stroke is a perfect one. The body itself is regulated at 98.6. We all understand that. There's forms, there's heat exhaustion, there's a heat emergency, there's heat exhaustion, there's heat stroke, okay? So during those three forms, they go up as they're supposed to based on the severity of the level. Heat stroke gets to the point where you're actually unconscious. Okay, a heat emergency is I'm not drinking enough fluid, I'm, over, I'm overly hot, I'm getting dizzy, maybe I'm stumbling a little bit, I need to get in the shade and I need to get fluid. Does that make sense to you? So the treatment though is knowing where your pulse points are and if you have them in your first aid kit, ice packs. So the reason you wanna know where your pulse points are is because you're trying to cool the blood. You know all that is in ice packs is um, alcohol, and death fluid. That's an ice pack. That's, that's what an ice pack is. It's death fluid and it's alcohol, rubbing alcohol. So if you keep, keep ice packs with you, and if you wrap, don't put it directly on the skin, right, because we don't want to cause more problems than that. A, a cold emergency or a cold burn is the same as a heat burn. It's no different when you're talking about body damage to the body as putting their hand over a flame or putting an ice cube on them. It causes the same form of tissue damage. It's just one's hot and one's cold, okay? So if you know where their pulse points are, and the belly is a big one, you want to cool off where most of their blood flow is, because what we're trying to cool off is the blood. That's what's going to cool the body. So the blood gets above 104, and we have, a, we have a big problem. Some people can get up to 107, some can get higher. But that's what you want to do. You get the person into the shade. If they have control of their airway and they're not having any problems where you don't think that they would have a problem swallowing, Give them some cool water, you know, because that's they really need the fluid, but it needs to be water, not beer. <laughs> they would probably ask you for a cold beer, but don't give it to them. Um, give them water and then take your ice packs, expose them and then take your ice packs and you put it on the big blood vessel parts of the body. Put it under their armpits, put it on their belly, put it on their femorals and just let them cool down. But you don't do it over so aggressively that they get the chills right? Because now that's counterproductive. If they start shivering, doesn't matter what you do, the temperature is going to go up. But if they're so bad that they're in heat stroke, the body itself loses its ability to self-regulate thermal activity, temperature. So you want to do it to get them in the shade, get them fluids, and start cooling them off that way. If you don't have ice packs, get a wet towel. Get something that's cooler. You know what I mean? But don't just put very cold items directly on their skin like ice ice bags, so you don't have an ice pack, but you fill a baggie with ice, or you know what I mean, wrap it in a towel or something like that. It's not, time isn't, you're not that much threatened by time. Do you know what I mean? The damage, by the time you get to heat stroke, the damage, it's already there. Now we're trying to bring it back down to stop the damage, stop the burn, you know what I mean? So that's what you would do. You would put it on their belly, put it under their armpits, get them into the shade, 
If they're able to swallow effectively and you don't think that they're going to choke or suck it into their lungs, that's called aspirate, then give them some cold water. But if you're afraid of that at all, they don't get it. Better to cool them off, let their mental status repair a little bit, and then you can. Now that's the kind of situation though, after you get them cooled and after they've experienced and they've sweat a lot, that's when they've lost a lot of their electrolytes. And that's one of the rare situations when you would say, have this Gatorade. But after you've given them plenty of water and they've refilled the tank, now they need to start replacing the electrolytes. You guys, is there any science majors in here? No? Cations and anions? Okay. So that is what you would want to be replacing because extreme dehydration, it causes your heart to go into very specific and unique rhythms that will kill you quick. Okay, so like if you have a calcium deficiency, calcium is one of the things that our heart uses to be able to pump itself, okay? But if I sweat it all out because of heat stroke, now my heart's not going to beat so well. Does that make sense to you? So in that situation, after you get them cooled and assuming the person's breathing and you caught it in time, get them cold water, get them cooled off, get them to where it's not an emergency, but then give them the Gatorade. And I'm saying Gatorade specific because they put electrolytes in. Smart water, I think smart water might put electrolytes in too. Drinks that advertise with added electrolytes, that's, that matters, okay? But in these very unique situations. Any other questions? Do you guys need to talk about kids or anything like that or are we all good? Kids are not little adults, they're different. Go ahead. Uh, several of us in here. Do we have kids, parents? Okay. so. Kids, um, vital signs. We'll talk about vital signs in kids. The younger the child, the higher the vital sign within the normal limit, if that makes sense. So an infant, if I just delivered a kid and that kid's three minutes old, I'm expecting a heart rate of around 150 to 160 beats a minute. Okay? If it was you and I see 160, I'm going to get an EKG on you right away because I'm thinking you're in a different cardiac rhythm and I don't need to give you medicine. But if it's this little baby, not true. Okay. Also, the little baby's respiratory rate could be anywhere from 30 to 60 times a minute, and that's completely normal. Okay. Kids are only more difficult because we're scared of them. That's the only, though that and IVs are a pain. But so, so we have the higher respirator, 30 to 60. We have the higher pulse, okay, up to 160. If they got below 100 and they were just born, I'm starting CPR because they shouldn't get that low right when they're first born. Okay, so we're looking for the 1 to 160 area, somewhere in there. Does that make sense to everybody? Unless, of course, they're pink and, you know, crying well. Then there's something else going on. Um, infants, neonates are pretty much birth to one year. One year to about five is considered preschool age. The numbers are higher, but now they start coming down from the infants because the kid itself is getting older. So a preschooler could have a pulse, you know, say a five-year-old, at 120, and that's normal for that preschooler. That's not anything for us to worry about. But if it's a preschooler that's been, say you guys go to a rodeo, say somebody's going to Corona Days, and your kids are out playing while you're off doing your thing, and their pulse is 150, that's something to be worried about. But they're likely suffering from some, some form of a heat exhaustion situation, and they just need fluids and to cool off. 150 is a little too high. 120, that's a good range for a five-year-old. And they can go down as low as 70 beats a minute, so 70 to 120 would be a good range. If you're ever concerned, talk to them. Check their mental status. With kids especially, they do something called head bobbing. If they're having respiratory problems, their head will start to bob like this. Adults will too, but it's, you, there's a thousand other things before an adult, before you get to that point that you'll know that they have a problem. But a kid, like an asthmatic kid, they'll start bobbing their head, and they don't know, they, they don't know that they're doing it. It's just something that they do. Now we know we have, we have a serious issue. That's considered an altered mental status. That's a neurological deficit that needs to be fixed right now. Okay, so if you have a kid that's got a five-year-old that's got a pulse of 160 and they're bobbing their head, we need to, you need to call 911, get them to the hospital, whatever you gotta do, that's abnormal. But if it's just a five-year-old that has a pulse of 120 and everything else is normal, then they're more than likely okay because that's within their normal limits, their normal limits. So from five years old to about 12, is considered adolescent and now you're pretty much the closer you get to 12 really the closer you get to puberty now you're normalizing into what's considered to be the adult level of vital signs so a seven-year-old might be at 110 that's okay that's nothing to worry about it's no big deal you don't ever want them below 60 because we'd have to find out why a seven-year-old shouldn't be below 60 beats a minute 
Um, so about 60 to 110, somewhere in there. But the closer you get up to the 12 year old age, you're looking at the 60 to 100 like you would an adult and the 12 to 20 like you would an adult. So an infant will breathe about 30 to 60 times a minute. A school age child or a preschooler will breathe up to 35, maybe even 40 times a minute, 20 to 40, I think is the book answer. Um, and then you have your young adolescents, which will be less than 30, but more than 12, okay? So depending on what their physical conditioning is and what kind of shape they're in. I mean, we have 10 year olds on blood pressure medicine, so it's really a wide range right now in our, in our society. So um, that's the thing for kids. Tracheal tugging is a big deal. If you think there's breathing issues with a child, don't waste time. Call 911, throw them in your truck, drive them, whatever you're comfortable with, just do. You know what I mean? Just react because it's, breathing's a big deal to kids. Kids do not compensate for long. A child is known for, they can, you won't know anything's wrong and then they're unconscious. Like they're very, very good. Their bodies are very good. If they get kicked in the belly by a, a goat or hidden, you know, with the goat's head rammed in their belly, they can sit there and play it off because they don't feel anything. They don't, they don't know there's a problem, but inside they're bleeding. They're going into shock. So you as dad or mom or whatever, we want to watch this kid. How's their mental status? Are they sweaty for no reason? What's their skin condition? Is it sweaty? Is it ashen gray? Is there pallor? What is going on? Because they won't tell you because they won't feel it. They won't know. And then they're just walking along and they just, they just collapse because their bodies are known to be able to compensate for a very long time or very well, I should say, for a short time. And then they just, there's no decline. They just go straight to worst case scenario. They're here and then they're down. And so, you want to pay attention for things like this. If the mechanism of injury is bad enough to cause you to concern, if you say, oh shit, then call. Do you know what I'm saying? Like really, if you're like, damn, call. Get the kid checked out. It matters. Let somebody else worry about it that's, that's trained and should know, okay? If not, if you can't call, if you're in a place where you just can't, like you don't have, there's a lot of places in the state that doesn't have EMS, um, throw them in your truck and, and just go. You know, statistically, they'll have a better outcome anyway. So not a stat that I'm proud of, but it's true nonetheless. So any other questions? I don't know what you guys might have on your quiz, so I don't know what to, to throw out there for just in case. <laughs> I don't even know, because I'm, I'm here unofficially, so I didn't make it. I don't, I don't have. All oh, right. So it's on the notes. It's in the notes. Okay. Um, is there any other questions? Have I gone long enough? Is this, has it been time? Yeah. So I keep Benadryl with me, you guys, if, in case you don't keep liquid Benadryl children's, um, because you never know when you're going to come up on somebody that has an allergic reaction. You hear about Epi and you hear about Benadryl for somebody that has an anaphylactic reaction, or you see on TV somebody like in Pulp Fiction where they inject the girl with the Epi straight in her heart and all that nonsense. The thing is about this is epi is just adrenaline. Adrenaline will temporarily cease the allergic response given by the body. Benadryl is the definitive fix. Benadryl reverses that. So keep the Benadryl with you. Unless you have somebody in your family or you yourself have an uh, allergic reaction that's bad enough to be anaphylactic, diagnosed by your doctor, you won't have access to an epi pin. But, so assuming you don't, keep the liquid Benadryl with you, and then you just take a drink of it, swish it around in your mouth, because you're, you can absorb quicker through the mucosas in your mouth than you can in your belly, and then swallow it, okay? That's gonna reverse the reaction, but time is everything in anaphylaxis, especially for people like us that are literally in the middle of nowhere, you know? I mean, there's, like I'm the only paramedic for almost 100 miles, if, and I'm anaphylactic to bees. The last time I got stung by a bee, I spent three days in the hospital. And all I remember is my wife, I would wake up and I would see my wife sitting there and then I was gone again and I was out again. So, like if I go down, <laughs> I'm kind of screwed. <laughs> but that being said, these little things make, this is all they do at the hospital in a lot of situations, I mean, without going to specialty, of course. But it's just wrapped in a different package and is delivered in a different way. And so a lot of these things we can do for ourselves from our trucks, from our houses, from that kit. I'm not kidding. That, that is, you can ask anybody in town, you can ask Shad. That's my kit. And it's not provided by 
any medical organization. It's what I always carry. And you can cover just about any emergency out of that, you know? And it's something that everybody can do. Don't buy commercial first aid kits unless you just want to, but they're incredibly overpriced. You can put it together yourself for $25, $35 tops, where if you buy everything in there commercially, it'd be like 300 bucks, because it's just ridiculous. But it's all available to everybody. Yes, ma'am? Um, you know, I keep, I'll, you're welcome to go, come through it, to go through it. Yeah, I keep a SAM splint. Do you guys know what a SAM splint is? I'm sure most people are familiar with them. Um, this is a SAM splint. You just cut it with scissors. So if, if this gentleman broke his arm, this is a, a, a hard cast. So right now it's weak because of the way it's bent. It's just a metal. So it just rolls and unrolls. But if I put it on my arm, like I broke this arm and, and the scar is right there because I had to have the surgery. I would put this on myself and then I fold up the edges and that gives it the rigidity that it needs. And then this folds in and I stick that in my hand so I can have my alignment and improve my circulation. Does that make sense? So I keep a sand splint, they're like six bucks or something. I, I don't really know because um, it's been so long, but what else do I keep? I keep hydrogen peroxide. I keep I keep calamine. This is a burn dressing. These work really well. I never actually recommend putting any type of, of fluid uh, ointment.